that? Yeah. How about this? So old school. So old school. It's good for me. I don't know about for you guys. I'm okay. Hey, totally. Oh, really? I like that already. Do you want us to have a mic? Can you guys hear us? Or do you want to be mics? <laughs> Typically, you can, hear you can hear me anywhere. That's usually not the issue. It's it's the other peeps. Yeah. Okay. No, I, think we'll, I think we'll use it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Here, okay, there you go. Now we gotta pass around. What am I gonna do with that? They can hear me. <laughs> I'm not gonna use the mic. Listen, I, first off, my hands don't stay still. So having a mic and doing this, you're not going to hear so me I anyway. Move, so probably, right? just be careful. Yeah, yeah. Just, just watch. <laughs> no, that's why Phil gave me one of these things. But you guys, I guess you guys can. I'm not touching it. I'm, I'm I've got it away it. from me. I'm not even itching. I'm okay. Uh, first off, uh, thanks for showing up today. Uh, when Christine and Scott uh, talked to me about this, even though I think this is apparently Kurt's idea, or he's taking credit for it, or anyway. What the, uh, what the talk was is, I think we started just, you know, maybe having a discussion about uh, sort of independent retail, et cetera. And I think we did get to the point where we said, you know, it'd be really cool if we had a few of the local independents actually uh, come on stage, if they'd be willing. Um, it's usually hard to get retailers to, um, to do these things. A lot of it, especially when you get into high corporate, there's 17 layers of someone in marketing and communications they have to go through to get permissions, yada, 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 right? But I was super thrilled when uh, these guys decided to do it. Um, Cam, I've only met a few times. Brian, just today. Arif, I've known way too long. <laughs> but what we thought, or the reason I think we really push, or the reason I wanted to push it, is I think everybody who knows me knows that I really love the independence. I love the small on both sides, whether it's the vendor side, and or the uh, retail side. I love the independent channel. I mean, even when I was at London, yeah, we were a bit larger and we had um, some breadth. I still thought that we were pretty small. I knew, I knew all the store managers, mostly assistant managers, like we knew everybody in the company. So it still felt very independent, like we were able to make decisions, you could, make, you could do things that impacted customers, which is why I was super stoked to have these guys on because they all have that ability. So. That's why this, why me, I probably because you guys ran out of people to ask to do this, but that's, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it anyway. I know. Well, Phil could have done it, but you didn't know Phil well enough, so <laughs> you guys are stuck with me. Uh, what I want to do with this is, uh, first off, I'll get the uh, three guys to introduce themselves, um, who they are, who they work for, potentially, I guess, how long, short stories, like two, three minutes, just so you guys get, uh, for those who don't know, what a Famous Foods, a Stong's is, or a Super Value. You'll, you'll know that in a couple minutes. And then we'll get into just, quite frankly, a discussion. I'm not going to pepper them with anything complicated. I'm not that bright. I, don't, I took some notes, which I never, ever do, um, and I won't probably read them anyway. But So it's, it'll be very, very conversational. Um, hopefully, what it'll incite, or what they'll tell you may incite you guys after to have some questions for them. Because I think with these three, more so sometimes than talking to a large corporate, you actually may get an answer. Where corporate tends to dance because um, they're bound by the dance. So that's what I'm sort of hoping um, happens. Um, in no particular order, I'll just start this way and okay. we'll go that way. So if Cam, you could introduce sure. yourself, who you are, what you do. Great. Uh, my name is Cam Bruce. I'm the owner of Famous Foods, uh, bought Famous Foods. Uh, 15 years ago, um, came from a completely op different background. I was in the wholesale. I was in your side. I was in the whole wholesale business. I still have that business. It's in the golf equipment business. So, uh, not quite sure what happened. I think it was a bit of a midlife crisis, and uh, <laughs> thought uh, a change was needed. And uh, talk about 180 degrees, though. Uh, just, uh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, just a completely different environment from what I was used to. Um, you know, a staff of about 10 sales reps across the country to a staff of 60, 65, uh, and just, you know, retail, dealing with 
people every day, customers every day. So anyway, it's, it's been great. Famous Foods has been around for almost 100 years. Um, long time uh, fixture in Vancouver. Started uh, down at Hastings and Clark and in our current location at Kingsway and Knight Street, we've been there for, uh, not 100% sure, but pretty much 45 plus years, I think, so. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, you know, we're a community store. We're, we have great support from our neighborhood, um, but we're also a destination store. And that kind of goes back to our roots where we supplied lar large bulk uh, items to, oh, to back in the day, tree planters going up north, uh, all sorts of uh, larger institutions would buy bulk items. And we still do a lot of that today. And we, uh, so we draw, we actually draw people from all over, all over the province. I have people from up north that come from the Sunshine Coast even, the island, but, uh, you know, Richmond, Burnaby, North Van. So we're, you know, we're kind of diverse that way. Um, but our main focus is, is in our neighborhood. And um, that's, that's sort of our bread and butter cool. is, is in our neighborhood. So. Cool. I moved here in 85. <clears throat> and I think even prior to moving, when we'd come down, or even after we moved, my mom and dad would come down to visit to make sure we were fed, right, and behave ourselves. And my mom, even 40 years ago, was going to Famous Foods for all her interesting spices, like cool stuff you just couldn't find in other places. And it's, she still goes, even after all these years of trying to do that. You've got it, Brian. You may as well start it up. Thanks, Kenny. Uh, Brian Bradley, I'm the president at Stong's Markets. Nice. Uh, lifelong grocer, grew up in the business, uh, worked in the corporate side for 31 years. I was with uh, Canada Safeway, and just over seven years ago, came over to Stong's Markets. So Stong's has been in business, depends who you ask, 1928, 1931. Uh, came to Vancouver on Dunbar Street. Uh, where we still have a store today. Obviously not this, the same store we had back then. This is the fourth store on Dunbar Street. Um, at one point in time, there were a number of stongs throughout the Lower Mainland. Had the one store in Dunbar for many years and in 2015 started our growth and, and moved to North Vancouver. The Northwood store we still operate today. Have the Dunbar store. We just recently uh, opened a store up in Squamish. Kind of a new concept for us. Uh, which has really paved the way for a couple more in the works right now. So lots of growth going on uh, within our company right now and uh, an exciting time to be there. And I, I would, somebody talked earlier about, you know, independence and the difference between the corporates and the independents. It's, uh, it's night and day and it's, uh, when I made that change seven and a half years ago, best thing I ever did. And uh, I was telling somebody at lunch, I've, I've spoken at this lunch twice before. Once as the corporate guy with, as Kenny said, with a script and yeah. uh, handcuffs on, and I could talk about this, <laughs> I couldn't talk about that. Uh, and then it came back uh, to talk about songs, where open book. And certainly, uh, if you have questions today, we're, there's no secrets in this business. And, and uh, you know, for myself, nothing's off limits. So, um, uh, at songs, uh, you know, we're really known for the local, the selection, premium offering. Um, and, uh, you know, I always tell people if, if you have a recipe and, and you can't find something in your recipe, usually you come to Stong's, you can find it there. Uh, we really, you know, we do business, we have kind of what we call our five key points of differentiation. And, you know, the big one in there is supporting local first. And I'm sure we'll talk about that through yep. the, through the uh, presentation today. But uh, that's, we're a big believer in supporting local small businesses. And, and uh, you know, that resonates with our customer base. So. Pleasure to be here today. RF. RF Ahmed. Uh, <laughs> so I've been uh, around in the business since pretty well I was born. Um, my dad was, uh, when he first came to Canada, uh, second job until he retired was um, being uh, an accountant for independent grocery stores um, since 1974. And through that journey of, of him, Working around grocery stores, um, he joined on with Choices back in 1999, where um, I went to go work in the warehouse. 
when CCW first uh, opened and started, and I worked in the warehouse and met a lot of you guys uh, through that, helping out on the retail side of the of the choice uh, choice of CCW business. Uh, went back to school, completed my undergrad, completed my CPA, and then went back to go work in a warehouse. So um, did that until we uh, until I took over as CFO in the choice of business until. 2018, when we divested the business to, uh, at the time, Bilo, now PFG. And my vision was for myself was to stick on and work in corporate because I'd never worked in corporate and I'd always worked for a family business and wanted to kind of see what it was like to work with really, really, um, you know, with a larger group and a bit of a, a different audience. And then an opportunity came up uh, to buy the store in Gibson's, and it was a super value store, which, funnily enough, my dad had been doing the accounting for since 1974. So um, he didn't have to deal with KPMG or any of those guys for due diligence, because my dad was like, yeah, the books are good, so I'm going to look at it. <laughs> and yeah, and so in uh, the week of August 20th, 2018, um, uh, we took over the store, I got married, and we moved all within the same week. My wife still hasn't forgiven me, but... Um, <laughs> And she's my business partner in all this and looks after everything to as she's texting me saying the kid's getting a nosebleed at home right now so um about three three years ago four years ago right we bought the store out in agassiz which was ironically another super value store uh both super value stores had been open since the 1950s i think it was 1957 so they've been around for a few years and um they're great community stores and i, I kind of fell in love with small towns in BC and kind of what the stores represent. I mean, you know, being an independent grocery in, in Vancouver and in the Lower Mainland, you know, it's super highly competitive and you're all fighting for the same dollar and you're all fight, fighting over the same supplier. And then, like I said, you go to these community stores and you're, you're still doing that, but, you know, like I always bring up the example of Gibson's is a town of a population of 5,000 people. And we get 1,800, 1,900 people through the store every day. So we see everybody in town every two and a half, three days. <laughs> it's a social setting. It's a, it's a social environment. And it's, it's awesome. And I, I love being an independent grocer in these small towns. So, you know, we have the two stores, you know, confidentially within this group and within the podcast world, obviously. Uh, we're working on a third, which will hopefully, uh, a third location, which hopefully we'll announce over the next day, week, two weeks. And um, yeah, same thing. Another community store, been in the community, supports the community. Community. You know, we sell food, but it's a social enterprise to support the town, and and you know, it's it's just a lot of a lot of fun just being with the people and being around the food. So, cool. Hang on to the mic. We'll start with you. <clears throat> For a fee, I can tell you the next door, but it's going to cost you. <laughs> I was sworn to secrecy, but I'm Italian, so money can <laughs> we, we can make something work if we really want to. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Um, one of the things today that I will we'll highlight it quickly and get it off the table. Um, this decade has been interesting. We'll, we'll go with that. Between COVID, supply chain, inflation, and pick whether it's in products, rent, labor, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's been a, a, a different five years than, I mean, in all the time I've been in retail. Um, what I didn't want to today, do today was focus on that part because I think we've done that ad nauseum and I think we're all probably pretty sick and tired of talking about it. What I did want to talk about, because these three folks up here did make it through, through, through all that. And it's really to highlight more the tenacity and the, um, the drive and, and the will to, to serve, serve their communities, et cetera, of the independence that I think it's just a cool story. So what I want to do with you guys is maybe, um, again, because I'm not going to really get involved in this. I'd rather you guys talk and tell the story. I, I don't want to really do much of, too much interrupting with you. But what I was wanted to start with is really Maybe some examples of just um, whether it's a product, whether it's a category or some technology or something. What, what's something you're doing in the stores now that maybe you couldn't have done four, five, six years ago um, that you're finding is just interesting and resonating so that we, we stay on more of the positive side of I think consumers are willing to spend money. It is tough out there, 100%. I agree. Like we get raw penny pinching, everybody's trying to make ends meet. But people are still shopping. And I think there's been a trend. Um, it's probably the first time we'll ever thank media to some small, small degree. But highlighting the, the sometimes problem when five or six guys own your existence of food purchases in a country of 41 million people 
um, I think there has been a trend, and you guys maybe can corroborate this, is a trend back to small, independent retail. So just maybe some examples are, if you have, and then go to Brian and Cam, of maybe something cool new in the store. Again, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's product, technology, but just something to highlight maybe. Yeah, I think the biggest, the biggest thing that has come out since 2020, at least what has been our, you know, my realization, my organization's realization of the business is just um, having that such close contact with the consumer and the customer and kind of knowing that, like, we always say listen to the customer, customer but um, actually listening to the customer. What are they actually wanting? What are they wanting to, wanting to engage in? Like, what is the weird thing that one person is asking for? Because there's a good chance there's probably 15 people looking for that really, really, really weird thing. And um, as, as, as corny as it sounds, but when, you know, as being the owner of the business, um, you work with the managers and you work with, you know, the supervisors and they all have that, you know, they all understand your quirkiness and your weird personality and, you know, the bad jokes, <coughs> bad jokes that you make along the way. And, you know, being able to really put that personality through the stores, like the really, like the greatest success, and it's, it's going to sound really stupid, but, the, you know, the biggest success that we've had over the last year is we came out with these reusable bags, you know, the, the typical canvas tote bags that you see in the store. And we've just started putting really... I don't want to say offside sayings on them, but like those supposed to be interesting, interesting things that you probably wouldn't get away with at a big corporate store. So like one of them we kind of came up with was, uh, food is my favorite F word. And <laughs> we put that on bags and within two weeks it became our number three selling item in all of grocery. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it has remained that way for about the last four months. So, I mean, people are asking for more. And like I said, it's, it's just, um, being that personality to the store and just just understanding it and just coming up with weird things that you might find really funny and maybe the customer will find it funny too. We've offended a lot of people, but <laughs> they're still They'll get over it. Whatever. They'll get over it. They'll get over it. Yeah. Exactly. We'll move on. What was the question? No. Um, you know, I, I would say that the, the, one of the big changes, and, and you know, again, we're going to talk about COVID, but the need. For, for local, supporting local and, 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 and helping other businesses transition. When I think of the number of restaurants out there that closed during that mm -hmm. time and, and they've evolved to say, you know, maybe we'll sell at retail. Maybe we'll, we'll pack, do packaged goods. And I'm looking at TAC back there because we, we partnered with the workshop, a plant-based restaurant in North Vancouver that had to close their doors and said, well, why can't we sell your product ready to eat? Why can't we sell your product in our store? And, and that really, uh, you know, springboarded into many others doing the same thing. So there's there's so many new items in the store now that are what we call it hyper local. It's it's local restaurants that have pivoted along awesome. the way and, and we've been a part of that. And I think I think consumers now are way more aware of local. And and there's a bigger desire to support local businesses, not just in the grocery business, I think in, in many businesses. So, you know, for us that would probably be the biggest change and it it, it dovetailed nicely with, with our mission as a company to, to do that. So it's been a it's been a benefit to us. But you know, I would it's hard to pick one item, but it's it's really all more about supporting more local. Awesome. Yeah, I would say both what Arif and Brian said is similar for us too. We we now carry a lot of products that um, were not even available to us pre COVID. I think Mainly, a lot of the coffee and the coffee skews, especially. We have a lot of, you know, coffee shops that everybody knew and visited, but now had uh, come out with retail packaging, and so now we're carrying a lot of that product in our store. Um, so I think to really to echo Brian, that's that's for us too. We're carrying a lot more uh, local products from smaller companies, and we always like we always like to. To listen to the, you know, we get people every day coming in, everyone's, you know, with all these new products, and we think that's a function that we can easily provide as opposed to going to the bigger chains where they have a lot of red tape to go through to get product. You know, we can make a decision right then and there. Yeah, let's bring a case in, let's whatever, let's do it right now. So I think that's really what, you know, what we try and do is uh, support these smaller manufacturers, distributors to, you know, <coughs> let them introduce their product. And I think 
to to echo Arif, um, the customer experience is is the biggest thing we we do. I feel sometimes we go we cause ourselves so much grief because we try and do too much for our customers, you know. Uh, um, but at the end of the day, if we don't, you know, if we don't have them, we're we're out of business. So um, so we'll do lots of things. If, you know, someone recommends a product, we'll search it, we'll find it, we'll bring it in for them. Um, we do lots of special order stuff, uh, so I think that's that's really become important. And the customers are more. The big thing we get is they want more information. Where's our stuff from? You know, ingredients, all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of work that goes on with that, trying to um, trying to provide that information to them. So <clears throat> he's got to be one of the biggest softies in the business because <laughs> I've been in the store where. Um, we were standing talking to him, and, and a customer did. I don't know. It wasn't even a, a, left, a left. It was a light way out in left field. I don't even know if it was in the same field. <laughs> but it, always trying to accommodate. Which again, when you get to size and rules and regs, near impossible, um, near impossible to do. And again, what we're trying to highlight is the fact that if you do have an idea or something cool, your odds in an independent are huge that you can get it probably potentially in the same day. So I guess where I wanted to follow up, because you did use uh, TAC as an example, and we'll start with you, Brian, is because we do have a vendor community, obviously, in this room, is maybe we won't pick on the ones who haven't done it well, but maybe highlight a couple who have done it very well. <laughs> so you can you know, give them some accolades, but maybe an example or two, and then we'll go back to RF and Cam, but maybe some, some people who have stepped out of the box, stepped up, like, you know what I mean? Like when they're trying to just do that, Right well, thing. Everybody in this room at Doe does it very well. <laughs> that's, see, that's a good politician. Nice answer. I don't believe it. I know a lot of you. I don't believe it. I believe it for many. Uh, you know, it, it, it'd be hard for me to pinpoint one particular item or, or company that's done it very well. I think companies that have success getting in with us and selling with us, uh, you know, come in, don't come in with 100 items. You know, don't come in totally. with a whole laundry list and fill the boardroom <clears> table and say this is, come in with those, those key sellers that you think would resonate with our customers. Knowing our customer base, we're not, we're, we don't have a price conscious or price sensitive customer. And that sounds odd, but you know, we're not, we're not a discounter and, and we don't try to be. And so, you know, if, if something is available in all the big box and it's, uh, you know, it's going to be available in Costco, it's probably not for us. Um, we're looking for more, you know, unique, boutique, healthy alternatives. And, and price point doesn't have to be a key decision maker. Um, you know, we have a, we're, we're fortunate. We have a customer that's, that's willing to pay for good quality. They want value, but that generally means good quality. So, uh, you know, pick those specific items you think would resonate with us and and you know not a big laundry list that you know all the big guys have this you need to have this it's, it's got to be what works for our customer fair enough Arf, if you don't mind i mean i i think the big thing for me is you know i, I know that and i've been on the import distribution wholesaler side as well so um you know i i, I know how difficult it is when a retailer asks you to do something that's outside of your box and sort of outside of your day to day. But any time that we've asked a manufacturer or supplier to be like, can you do something just outside the lines? Because we're trying to accomplish something here. And this would go a really long way with what we're trying to accomplish. Um, it, go, it, it makes such a big difference for us, and this is such a huge point of differentiation for us. Like, off the top of my head, I can think of like locally in Gibson's, you know, um, Henry Reed Farms, uh, local farmer, does something like a, a specific microgreen for us that works really well for our customers and, and what they ask for. Um, Canterbury Coffee, like, you know, do, doing a, a, a blend for us that customers can only buy at our store. You know, my past life working with, with, with Calkins and Burke and Carol and um, told you I'd show you out. But, um, <laughs> you know, just being able to do something that was like specifically available to us that gave us that little point of differentiation that was that kind of not just set us apart, but it was an opportunity that we had identified and worked with the manufacturer, the supplier to, to say, hey, this would be a huge help and, you know, I'm a huge pain in the ass, but 
it made such a big difference in, in, in my small business. So. so we'll hear from Cam in a second. So fair to say though, because I got asked at, at lunch, I was asking because I was a buyer for trillion years, like what did, what did, what's one thing that you wanted in your reps as they came in? And what I told him is I want to be prepared and don't come as an order taker. Walk my store, figure out what my holes are, figure out what my pain points are, and maybe come to me with some solutions. So you can pick up on that, Cam. I'd like to hear if you can point, point a couple of vendors, but yeah. to me it's sort of that play too. Like we're, we're here to work together, but help me, right? Yeah, I think that's, that's the big thing. And for us, we feel like we're at a bit of a disadvantage just being one store. So, you know, we, we don't have the ability to, to maybe buy larger uh, quantities. Um, but even, even just for new, for new product especially, um, you know, just help us promote it. Um, maybe smaller, you know, smaller case stacks to start to give us a chance so we don't feel overwhelmed with it all. Um, but I think that's the big thing is the helping with the promotion of the product is key. We have a we have an engaged clientele, so if there's a way you know that we can do do more demos, do more product information, that's going to help help our product. And we've had some good success with those that have done that. The consistent demos in our store, um, where they really try and you know build the awareness of their brand to our customers. That's that's worked with uh, with a few a few suppliers really well, and I think that's. For us, that's probably the, the key. We don't have the marketing machine to um, maybe to promote like some of the others do, but uh, I think the help help in store promotions with us is probably the key. Okay, so, you can hang on to it. Yeah. So, I was going to go with this one. I'm trying. Uh, from what I'm listening to, I've heard you know out of the box. I've heard you know sort of come to me with um, ideas and solutions. I haven't heard anything about price. Um, you just alluded to it now, and so did Brian, that as focused as we are on television and media about price, which we should be, it's, it's not cheap out there, I get it. But really nobody up here at this point has sort of talked about, I need rock bottom price, I need, you know, you know, full truck load, but I'm going to order three cases. It's, I don't, price hasn't seemed to be a thing. You bar baby both in relative, or th all three of in unique places where maybe your consumers are a little more willing. It's a, it's more of a value, and value is price times, you know, qu uh, quality, as opposed to price times, price times, price times, price. Um, so, is I, what are you finding? Well, I mean, I'm assuming you're, you got people. It's my mom shops your store. Yeah, yeah, my yeah, mom will yeah. run the city for oh, 99 cent tuna. When you've been around okay. for 100 years, you got a yeah. lot of old okay. customers. Just so you know, that's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not, not telling I'm not you. You said she's 100 years old. No, no, I'm I not suggesting that, that either. Okay, no. just in case. Um, yeah, well, I'm thinking price is just kind of a non-issue almost, <laughs> right? It's you know, there's not much we can do about it. Yeah, would we would we like um, better pricing? Sure, we have. We definitely have a price-conscious clientele. I think the still a big majority of our clientele is that way. But so for us, trying to, you know, trying to. Uh, focus on whenever we can get deals, looking at deals more to offer our customers products um, that are on sale, that we can put on sale is, is really key for us. So we always have, try and have a lot of stuff on sale in store. So yeah, the price is, you know, people, I think the one thing is people are, they're a little bit immune to it now, right? They're, you know, it, we've gone through the hard part. Yeah. And so I think, we're finding where we would have said, there's no way we're gonna sell that in our store. We find it sells, you know? And uh, so that certainly is changing a little bit, but we still have that uh, large group that are price conscious. And uh, so, you know, we have to be aware of that. We can't, right. we can't uh, forget about them. So, uh, yeah, I guess the big thing for me would be, yeah, if I could get, if I could get, you know, skid pricing and not have to buy full skids. That's, I mean, I guess that's, I know that's <laughs> in a perfect Might be world. a fantasy, but well, yeah. No, but I mean, I might still buy the skid, but yeah. I just might take, you know, I might buy it over a couple months instead of all at once. So, you know, that, that would be great. <laughs> you can comment on that when, yeah. when it's your yeah. turn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
it's sort of same thing. I, I guess still, the, still down this line, I know, Brian, you def definitively alluded to it that you don't necessarily have a price conscious, but I do think value is obviously a huge component of this. Yeah, I think the value proposition is huge, and, and Cam touched on it. You know, particularly in our Dunbar store, we have a lot of old customers too. We've been there 100 years, there's, there's some older <laughs> customers, and they tend to be much more sensitive to price. So to think that, you know, we're completely um, insulated from, from that price image piece would be naive. So there is still the need to be competitive. And, you know, we like to remain competitive. I understand that, you know, we're, we're not buying in trailer loads or pallet loads all the time. And, and you know, if it's, if it's, you know, we don't expect rock bottom pricing, we want it to be fair. And, and I think, you know, everybody we deal with is fair with the pricing. It's, where you can probably help us is, is highlighting price opportunities. I and mean, we don't have a high tech pricing analyst and you know algorithms and whatnot that a lot of the, the big CPG companies might have access to, but even, even um, uh, you know, just, just uh, thoughts on as you walk our store and you see stuff where you say, yeah, you're, <coughs> you're priced too high compared to everywhere else I, I uh, sell into. But maybe there's opportunities where there's there's items we, we aren't high enough because we discover those all the time. And the sad part is how we discover that is sometimes through our sales reports. We're looking at particular items and going item by item. It's just, we're selling a whole lot of that particular item. Why? Why? Yeah. And then we find out we're two bucks cheaper than real Canadian down the street, which doesn't happen often, trust me. But it, it's happened to us where we've either, you know, just it's, it's come in and somebody's, you know, yeah. put it in at the wrong price and we don't have this big department to, to track and monitor that. It just kind of ad libs, hey, why are we selling so much of that? And so it's happened. So, you know, we could always use help with that too, rather than just focusing on what you're selling to us for, just helping us with the whole value proposition. Yeah, and, and I, I think, you know, you guys have highlighted it really, really, really well. Um, you know, at the end of the day, like, you're never going to, I'm never going to win an argument with the customer that's complaining about the, the, the price on something, like, just, just bad interaction on my part. And so, you know, the big thing for us is, you know, one, being hypersensitive of, you know, what we're selling, what the competition is doing, paying real close attention to my costs and, you know, the guys that I deal with in here are probably sick of hearing from me. Um, I'm looking at you, Dustin, about, um, you know, what, what, the, you too. Yeah. <laughs> we'll exchange numbers. Um, but the big thing for us is really highlighting the value for customers when we do get a good deal on something and, you know, establishing like, hey, this is a really good deal, guys. Like we got, we got, you know, 399 butter on this week, load up. Or, you know, this is, you know, my, my, um, my clerks and my managers are they're, they're the best salespeople and you know they're, they're hunting the flyer as, as close as the next person or then the customer's walking in and they're the ones saying hey good value on this this is a great deal make sure you stock up on this make sure you load up on that and and really just highlighting for the customer what's actually uh, what's a good cost what's a good price and you know from from you know me and my managers levels is just being hyper vigilant to try to ask for those deals too and say hey what have you got for me what are you trying to you know, what do you have too much on? Like, what is Walmart not buying that, you know, that, that we can, you know, bring into our warehouse and give the customers a good deal? And, you know, we sell lots of product. We pay our bills a lot faster than anybody else and than, than the corporates out there. So what is my competitive advantage than, you know, the corporate down the street? And, you know, just, just really working with the manufacturers and vendors and suppliers to, to you know, kind of say, hey, we might, we might not be buying 18 pallets of, you know, of, of milk like uh, the yig up the road, but I can probably execute on something way faster and get you get money in your hands a lot faster. And, and really, like I said, just, just passing that value on to the customer at the end of the day. Cool. Hang on to it. I'll, we'll start with you. I, I, again, I think, and it's not, an, I'm not implying that the room doesn't do it, but I, I mean, I've been around way too long and I'm sure they see the thing too. It goes really back to is an order taker, I can do, I can do my own orders, I can count. Even when I was at London, I, I had the ability to write 12 or 100 on an item, I can do that. What I didn't necessarily see was what the world was doing. So bringing me information to say, listen, Benicio, you're too high on this, or you know what, you could go up on this, or here's an opportunity to buy because so-and-so is no longer carrying it, or things like that. It's really what I say, it's doing the rep's job. Like, it come prepared to help. 
right? Because independents will buy, but they, it's, it's sort of a blind thing to your point. You don't have 50,000 people, you know, crawling the internet trying to find pricing. You just don't have the time to do that. So you hope that on the other side of the desk that you're bringing that sort of uh, information to us. Yeah, I, I want to challenge you on that because I, I think that Please do. The, the, you know, the world is now that this information is presented to you. Like, you know, we have people that are writing the orders on the shelf, but, you know, with as much respect to the sales reps as possible, but, you know, I've seen on Instagram what the product is before the rep comes into the store. So, you know, when I'm asking the question, say, hey, how come you guys haven't brought this in yet? Like, I already know the information before you guys got in. Send me the information. Let me review it. I, I can look at a spreadsheet. I can see what's interesting to me. I can see, you know, what's, you know, what's going to sell based on, you know, what the, what the cost is on something. So, you know, my, my challenge for anybody that's, that's coming to chat with me or wants, wants to present something to me, send me the information. Let me take a look at it. And... I'll ask you the questions if something is if something is of interest to me because it's easier for me to it's easier for me to do the research if you're sending it to me and if it's sitting on my laptop than it is for you know somebody to book a meeting send in a box full of samples that sit in the corner of the office that again right. you know collects dust yeah and, yeah you know it's yeah it's it's, it's it's not really helping me at all it's 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 too long of a decision cycle get me the information let me make a decision fast. The yeah. information is there for me. Yeah. Can I just sort of uh, add on to that a little bit? Um, you know, certainly, yeah, information about about new products is, is really important. But the other thing we find is just sometimes the communication with with current product and pricing, especially like how how price increases are communicated to to us. A lot of times, it's just. Oh, look, and I happen to look at this invoice and see the price has changed. Like, honestly, it happens a lot, and it's really tough, and it's really caused us a lot of problems over, especially the last couple of years here. So if there's, for any of you out there, if there's better ways to communicate price increases to us, that would really be <laughs> uh, I think so. helpful for sure, um, because some companies do it, some companies do it really well, but um, it's... Uh, you know, we don't have, I don't have a department that's just looking at invoices, you know, all, all day, every day. And uh, so uh, just to add on for the, the think, communication side, right? I think it's also one thing to highlight. I mean, I came from the other side too, where I wanted, not, I didn't want, I got 90 days minimum right. on a price increase. So in essence, a lot of small people financed, you know, my owner was not destitute, um, financed them for an extended period of time. Most independents will pay in net 15 or 215, net 30. Most majors, you are financing multi-billion dollar companies for 60, 90, 120 days in cases, right? So it's, it comes back to even to that side of it where with the independence, you typically can get money faster. Granted, it's not 17 truckloads, I get it. But I find it massively offensive to wait for a company doing $100 billion a year, 90 days, and then still get screwed for a percent. Right, and most independents or small ones don't do that, so that, that drives me mental. But that's just me. Uh, one last thing, because I do want to open up more to you guys if you have questions for the three of them, is and this is a quick one. So now that we've got one swear word, Christine, just one, and it's a light one. So once we get out of the shit of the last five years, which hopefully is finally coming to an end or stabilizing, what do you see? I'll start with you, Cam. What do you see uh, maybe next year? or for the remaining years of this decade? Like, what, do you see, it's a tough gig. Yeah. Retail's yeah. not easy, it's not yeah. for the faint of heart. Right. But are you feeling a lot more optimistic? Are you feeling better? I, you know, I, I do. I think the last few months have actually felt the best they've felt in the last few years, I think. Oh, lovely. And, and I think for us and our customer, it's about, our customers are, um, um, they're, they're not as concerned about the ready to eat product they're, they're, they're cooks right they so they're looking for ingredients they're look they're, they're doing that um, and I think that you know I'm looking to, to see more and more people doing that because I think they, they feel they can it could be more economical for them doing it that way you know they'll come in and you know buy 20 kilos of flour and right. start making their own bread and you know um, that sort of thing so I, that's where I see for us you know because we have a little bit of unique business right. with the bolts that um, uh, that are potential cool. going forward. Whoever grabs it. Uh, I'd say I'm, I'm very bullish on the next several years. I think 
we're in a good position for growth. I think I think what we're seeing, and maybe maybe it's more amplified in this marketplace, is uh, the 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 middle, and I call the middle the conventional grocer, uh, is loaded. There's not a lot on the premium side. There's you know there's there's a lot of business going to the discount side, and I think the middle is overloaded, and I think uh, you know it's, it's going to turn into a race to the bottom there, which gives independents like us a real good opportunity to grow and take advantage of these opportunities and, and really continue to differentiate ourselves from a conventional grocer. And I, I think you're going to be able to see a bit of a resurgence of the independent chains, if you want to call them that. Um, there's going to be a, a lot of opportunities for, for us type guys, you know, with, with a couple stores to, you know, grow into, you know, four, eight, 10, 15, 20 store chains over the, over the next, you know, I don't want to say next five years, but, you know, over the, well, maybe you, but, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but there's going to be an entire generation of store owners that are wanting to retire, you know, COVID treated them really well, hopefully, um, you know, they've, they've made their money, they want to retire, and a lot of them don't want to sell to the big guys out there because they, uh, they, they really give a shit about their staff, and they really care about them and you know it goes more more to, than just like i want to get a big check to buy another boat and sit on a lake for the rest of my life they, they really care about their you know 8 10 15 20 staff members and i know that haven't been through this a couple times that's always been the number one number one thing in, in, in talking to the old owners i mean you know this one i'm going through right now the biggest deal for him is uh, a couple of my staff members throw away their garbage in the store uh, store garbage bins, they, can they keep doing that? <laughs> That's the <laughs> biggest thing you worry about? Yes, we can look after that. <laughs> so, you know, there's going to be, you know, there, there's going to be some, some good opportunities for, uh, for, for, for growth for, for us, us smaller guys out there, and I'm, I'm really excited for that. Cool. I want to leave time. I'm hoping for, I mean, I may have dragged that a little longer, but um, so I don't know if you guys want to grab the mic or if the people can just stand, but um, I'll let you, the two of you, regulate this. I, yeah, I don't want to do it. Thank you. I like sitting we'll, up we'll, here. We'll just yell our answers. Yeah, we don't need to mic. Oh, got one back there. Laura. Hi. Hi. Um, you talked about local being one of your purchase drivers, right? So in terms of your um, hyper-regional food trends, what do you see in your store locations as being your uh, trendy your food? I, I mean, Kathy touched on not but not ready to eat meals as not being a trend. But what are some of those trends that you're seeing in your regional stores? You're the one who said hyper-local. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, my thoughts on probably a little different than Cam's, yeah, because yeah. I think for us, uh, ready to eat, grab and go is a huge part of our business and a huge growth part, and it's an area we're gonna continue to focus on. I mentioned our new store in Squamish, it was really built with, with that in mind. Um, and I think there is opportunity for that. People are busy. People are busy, busier than ever been. And you know, whether it's they're they're running from soccer practice, from school, to wherever they're going, and you know, trying to find a healthy uh, meal to grab on on the way, or something that they can take home and prepare very easily that, that's easy to do. And there's you know, there's, there's some health benefits to it. Um, nobody wants to drive through a McDonald's drive through they do it out of necessity. So if you can replace that with a healthy alternative, you're gonna win. Anything to add? Um, yeah, I mean, very much, very much the same. And you know, in terms of you know, hyper, hyper local is you know, it, it, there's a big thing about you know, for me, it's just more really wanting to support the local businesses because you know, it's, their viability is good for everybody around so you know if there's a way for us to be you know continuing to support them and you know just, just in terms of like specifically the types of products that 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 would be looking for is you know just good tasting food i mean it, it doesn't really it, it, it could be anything but i mean people have such um you know they want to try if it's going to be Malaysian food or Thai food or you know just a really good burger, but just being able to bring those restaurant quality tastes home, they, people just want really, really, really good food. It doesn't matter what it is. A uh, bit of a cop out answer, but good food. Thank you. And sorry, just as a follow up, um, you know, with the new front of fat nutrition 
symbols that are out there you talk about being healthy, are you seeing a lot of your suppliers starting to move or change the formulation to maybe mitigate some of those fun pack symbols that they don't have? It is such a huge barrier. Yeah. It is. There, there, there's no if or buts about it. Um, you know, I, I think for us, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to have you know somebody you know within an organization that has, you know is familiar with that type of stuff. So I don't, you know, I'm the big guy in a, in, in, in a very small market, but I also have the you know access to the resources to help somebody out. And you know, we've got you know we partner with uh, you know Coho Commissary and 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 you know helping the suppliers that are manufacturing out of there to say, hey, we can help you with the labeling. You know, make sure you sell to us first, and then you can sell to everybody else. <laughs> but you know, th there's scalability there if you, if you guys want to do it right. But you you have to do it right. Yeah. So. Thanks, Laura. Right. Yeah. Uh, my question is from distribution, and what types of reports do you guys run, or can you run to get out of that data around local versus the? Especially products versus sort of the stuff that you're you're going uh, one to one with the conventional in your neighborhood. Like, how do you get at that data to know that you're being successful outside of the grab and go stuff, like package goods, for instance? And with that type of attribute type reporting coming from someone like us, help. I'd like to exp make, yeah even push that a little harder. Like, factory sales, quite frankly, mean nothing except for the person selling it. Like when I, when I was in retail, I knew my factory sales, I don't care. I wanna know what's selling. And even now working with distributors or my own brands, I don't care what I've sold in, I really wanna know what's selling out. So maybe to expand on it, I love when they tell me, if I could get access, let's say to him, and say, listen, how is the pasta set doing in general, selling, and specifically my products, I would love more information than that. Where I can get that from the large guys, I just can't get it sometimes from the smaller guys. Yeah. But working for you from a trend point of view inside your retail environments so we can respond. Exactly. It's back to POS though, right? We're at the scale, but is that your scale? Exactly. We can respond and we can see more about what's working for you. Right. Because we can see what's working for you. Right. So I don't know where you guys were at that, but sharing of POS or that type of information, it's a little tougher and smaller. I get it. We have that information. To be honest with you, it's just a matter of resources and spending the time to do it. So we can data mine if, if you have a data mining department, which we don't. Um, it's, you know, we have people that are very quick and, and, and good at it and they'll do it for their sections. You know, I think for, for us uh, in particular, uh, I would like to say we have experts on the floor. Like, we don't do the buying upstairs. The buying is all done on the floor. And, you know, I can use our frozen foods guy as an example where he can tell you, and you know I can check the report to verify what he tells me, but he's working that section every day. He knows what's selling, what's not, and then he could walk up and down that aisle and tell me about every single item and what, what's, what's doing well, what's not doing, doing well. We do have the data for you know, other areas where we don't have that expertise, and it's just a matter of having the resources to, to go through that data. Yeah, I, I know from our point of view, we're, you know, we're very much old school. We're very hands-on with Brian saying, like our, our guys are on the floor all day, every day, and um, we rely on them. So if there's information that you can provide from certainly the products we get from you, that would be huge for us because we just, we don't have those resources to, to do it. Certainly, certainly we don't. Okay. So, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, for, for me, like, I, like okay, I, I, I'm a numbers geek. Um, I love data. I look at data and you know it, it tells me a story and then I walk downstairs on the floor to see if it's telling me the same story. And if it's not, why not? So to answer your question, like as much data that can be provided, that way like you know I don't want to use like you know could go too heavy into sports analogies, but you know easy, you know doing a full money ball to kind of say, okay, you know what? Here's the frozen food section. What's in sweet? What's in savory? Okay, let's, let me drill down a little bit, a little bit more. Okay, in, in in the sweet section, what's in ice cream? Where are the trends going? Okay, now let me drill down a little bit more than that. You know, within the brands, what's growing? What's not growing? 
you know, what's local, what's not, what are the price categories? And like, there, there, there's no magic answer to say, run the spreadsheet and it's gonna spit out a number, but like, yeah, having to having somebody or, or having the skill set to be able to interpret that data and kind of see where it's going. But, you know, part of the beauty is, or part of, part of the exercise is one, being familiar with the data, but also like just collecting as much as, as, as is available to kind of test the hypotheses to, to um, see if it makes sense and then just take a chance. Anything more? Answer your question. No, I'll just add that at our scale and the volumes we deal with, even our trend data, amalgamating everything that you guys do and everything, all the, you know, we, for those who aren't familiar, we serve um, 1,200 locations across Western Canada with dry food or frozen uh, organic and natural products and also uh, supplements and personal care. And even, and our number one account is Whole Foods. So if you were to take Whole Foods data and some of your data and put it together, still something can hit and blow the data sideways. Then we still aren't big enough to even give you that trend analysis. So, but you know, I'm working on different ideas how to draw certain, how to get the noise out of the data so that we can see what you, what you guys need because it is it's the most vibrant piece of the industry is exactly what you guys are doing, well, in particular you guys. And um, so I just I'm a data person, so I'm just trying to figure out ways to get information that we can all use that um, benefits but everyone involved, right? So yeah, and, 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 and just, just, just to further on that, but also like being on the other side of it is, you know, finding somebody that speaks the same language as you two, right? Because <laughs> what think, that information is for sure. Yeah. We, we, yeah, I, found, I think we got one found, for you, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to be doing data for everybody. Yeah. Did you want to be alone? <laughs> yeah. Fine, <laughs> already. Anybody second? Yeah, go. definitely leverage the University of uh, UBC, their uh, master's resource economics program. They're always looking for projects. Mm -hmm. and this oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. You can just get a body or two right. to run your numbers. And that's Is it free? Cool free is even better. Free's good. Free's yeah. good. Free's pretty good. Sign us up. Yeah. I think someone had a question. Someone there had a question. Yeah. <laughs> there was a question I think someone had a question. Yeah. So we deal with grocers, uh, independent grocers majorly, and uh, we, we've looked at a lot of reports and recent years now we've heard that natural and organic groceries might be on the decline in terms of consumer behavior essentially. Now um, as for independent retailers like you, what do you think that is the natural organic uh, consumer behavior the same? Is it growing just because you're very different from the big corporate guys who actually pay attention to what the consumer wants or essentially is paying attention to healthy and good food at a great value? Or you think it's becoming more of a conventional grocer where um, you don't really care about the ingredients? I, Thank you, Christine. I think what we've seen a little bit because our customer is certainly largely slanted to the natural organic, but I think the realities of economic realities are, are affecting their buying decisions. And so I think that's maybe why we're seeing, you know, certain areas where we're just not selling, you know, as much natural or organic just because the pricing is prohibitive for a lot of people. There's only so much money to spend every month. And, you know, if, if I can go and buy conventional chicken and get three meals out of it as opposed to for the same price as I can maybe get a meal and a bit buying our organic or non-medicated, that's just a decision they have to make. And I, so we've definitely seen that a little bit. I, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's drastic at this point, but that's certainly a concern, so. Um, follow up to that question and uh, have is it because it's just part of the grocery aisle or is it a high consumer change, which is, um, you talk about chicken, maybe yes, meats is one thing, which is, I believe, quite a price when it comes to a product. Yeah. What about real ingredient grocery that we've been talking about here? Or dry goods, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Um, hmm. I don't know. I, I don't know if I have a, a handle on that. Um, but I, I just feel there's just this 
general kind of uh, feeling that people are, you know, there's just certain things they're just not going to be able to spend money on, whether it's, you know, it could be even just an organic cookie, you know, that's now seven ninety nine for a little box of cookies, right? Like, you just can't, they just can't justify yeah. that, right? So. As I'm passing, I, you know, I might look at it as that, if I'm buying natural and organic, I, I don't think I'm going to go down to, um, for lack of a better sort of bargain basement. Right. I may buy less frequently. Um, maybe I can sub organic if I can get really clean, you know. Or maybe I'll look at the ingredient deck. Maybe they don't have organic certified, but I know they're using organic ingredients. So I, I think because I do think price. I mean, there's only X amount of dollars at the end of the day. You know, everything's gone up, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 percent. I'm pretty sure, unless someone can tell me different, I don't think wages have followed that. So definitively, my pocketbook is a lot different than it was. So I'm assuming there might be maybe within moving, but I think it would probably just less of. I don't think I'm going to, I'm not going to jump off the ship and go right into, you know, high sugar, palm oils or right. whatever. Right. I don't think I will anyway. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would agree with that. And, and I don't have fact, I have fat. Feelings, <laughs> assumptions, and thoughts. I don't have facts for you, uh, but I get the, the same feeling as that. You know, it, it, the, everybody's pocketbooks are tight, so you know, spending more is a, a big concern. But I think it doesn't necessarily have to be natural or organic. There's much more awareness of what's in stuff, the ingredients. Uh, I'll use my son as an example. He's got this app where he scans the UPC oh God. and it gives it a score. I can't yeah. remember what it's called. Uh, what is it? Yuka, yeah. yeah, something like that. Anyway, I don't let him scan the stuff I consume. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, that's the kind of stuff they'll be looking at. Okay, if I'm not going to spend, you know, $7.99 for the organic cookie, let's look, well, this cookie looks interesting. You know, what's, what's the ingredients there? And they're still making uh, a decision for healthy reasons, but maybe not going full organic or natural. Yeah, and I think people are, always going to trade up or trade down, right? And, you know, <clears throat> our job being in store and, you know, the biggest win that we'll get is when somebody trades up, right? Hey, have you tried this out? It's, it's like a really good product. So, and, you know, if they, if they come in another time, they'll either tell you that this is like the worst thing they ever tried or they, they, they loved it and they're going to buy it again. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, people's, you know, people have a food budget and it's, it, it moves on a weekly basis up, and up, up or down. <laughs> People are going to make sacrifices in, in all areas of their lives, and um, you know. And, and the thing is, that how can you help them make the best decision for, for, for living within that budget? Hello. Hi there. Uh, I recently launched, like four months ago, a Vancouver-based confidence startup, and we initially launched with a direct consumer strategy, but we realized very quickly that our customers want to see us in the local. So in the last month, we've been in like five stores or so. And we do geographically target an ad spend around each of the stores. My question is, how can we attribute the ad spend to what we're seeing at your store level? Is there a way? Any ideas? Just want to hear that. Yeah, well, I, I think the big thing. I think the, the question is, you know, how to justify localized ad spend against the. But more to uh, correlate, I guess. To see what's happening at the store level. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the easiest question is just ask for a sales report from the store or from from the handful of stores in that area to kind of see if it's if, if it's actually working. Um, you know, it's, it's it's probably you know one of the greatest things with you know social media marketing these days is you can you know hyper focus almost to the household of the the ge geographic region where you where you want to market to, and then being able to um, you know almost immediately see if it's if it's having having an impact on it. Um, I think it's way more effective than, you know, throwing a flyer in a newspaper and hope that, you know, well, one out of every 8,000 ends up in somebody's hands and, you know, that they see your picture on page eight, which is that big, in, in a flyer. I think it's way more, it's, it's way more effective spend and, you, you know, you can, it's, it's quicker results or, or quickly, uh, quicker to actually see whether you're getting results. I think if you're actually doing it too, I think letting the store know that you're doing something because if you know if you're going to Brian Street, say, listen, we're going to hit North Van Stongs. If he knows that and his staff knows that, you may actually be able to go in and get back to that anecdotal. It's not even anecdotal with these cases because the, the person doing the aisles knows what's selling, but you may end up getting um, 
some robust data that way where you can go in and say, hey, we did this, we're going to do this. You might even get support out of it. You might get an end plate. Who knows what you get? Again, in independence, it's easier because they're more willing to do it. You, in corporate, you might get it. It may cost you trillions because your flyer ads aren't going away, my friend. I don't know what planet you're on over there, young man, but that, that co-op can't leave buildings because it, it funds so many other things. But with independence, it's not as critical. It's really about making sure their customers are happy and that their stores are moving. So I'd probably maybe work a lot tighter with the store as well. Yeah, and you, can, you can think of lots of examples of the power of social media, as I've, I've talked a little bit about it. You know, you're right, people are down the aisles, they see what's moving, what's not moving, but it's, it's amazing when Oprah, somebody comes out with yeah. a recipe. <clears throat> it's like overnight, and, and we have the ability to react to that if we know that's going on. Right. Usually it's reactive more than <laughs> proactive. You know, proactive. It's like, what the hell's going on down yeah. here? Well, didn't you hear somebody that you know, is on social media? Well, didn't you hear about this new recipe? Everybody's making this now. So it's a powerful, powerful tool. Until that person gets cancelled. Yeah. <laughs> There's an app out there that my web developer was talking to about. There's a royalty app that I'm looking at exploring. The only thing is, though, it's a small business, a new business to the market. It's $299 a month to kind of use it, but the royalty app what it allows you to do as a consumer and as a small business is that you can advertise through it that if the individual walks into the grocery store, they can actually scan what they're buying and it puts credits in their app and then they can go and redeem it. And it builds like the royalty for the website, but it actually builds ads and consumer exposure to the real of the retail. Okay. I'm curious yeah. about the we should, model, we should wrap this up anyway. Have would be beneficial, would that be something that you guys would want to join in and kind of do a joint marketing campaign around it or kind of leave it? Like Don't make our businesses more complicated than they already are. <laughs> like if, if, if we need to, you know, let our cashiers know about yeah. another app or another this or another that or another <laughs> report we need to fill out or another this, that or the other, like, no thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Give Scott the last one. Give Scott the last question. <laughs> oh, you get the microphone. I get the microphone. Wow. I'm not close enough to the stage, so. <laughs> um, this is just a fun question to end off. Is, is, is there a product or something that you've launched at the store that surprised you and how it performed based on you know, the demographics and what, what you've seen? So it's something interesting over the last year or two. Oh, I got that one. <laughs> I got that one. I got that one because it's neither healthy, it's neither <laughs> organic, but it is local. Anybody heard of those pretzels? Oh my God. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It is in the top five of our grocery departments That's every awesome. single week. It's our number two item in Squamish. Those pretzels, and it was local. Lady was in a farmer's market out in Langley. Uh, somebody came in with a bag and said, hey, we need to get these. We reached out to her, saw them at a brewery one day. They're on our <laughs> shelves a week later. They were on our shelves before she even had a UPC or a proper label. Yeah. That's awesome. And we cheat a little bit. Yeah. Uh, unbelievable. Ah. So that, that's an item that I would just jumps to mind right away. Very cool. I refer to it as crack in the bag. Yes. <laughs> Lovely. Um, there's been so many. Um, I think, I think the local breweries that we deal with um, and all the non-alcoholics, yeah. uh, they're, they're so fun to deal with. And they have such a good following, whether it be, I don't know, you name it. And um, there doesn't seem to be any type of, like it, it, every, everybody thinks that theirs is the best and every customer thinks that tastes the best. And so it's just, just really fun to be able to watch that category explode and the number of, uh, uh, just innovative players that are in that space. Um, it's, it's just really fun to watch. We have to get this young man on the road pretty fast here, so we'll make I think this the last. One item for us is uh, these uh, waffles. Um, Merci uh, 
can't pronounce the last name. We sell it's three waffles. We sell for like sixteen dollars or something. And so, and again, like there's no way these would sell. We we cannot keep them in stock. So I haven't had them myself. So, but, but yeah. So you, yeah. That, you know you never know, right? Are they never, frozen? Yeah, they're frozen. Yeah, they're frozen. Yeah. 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 Sixteen bucks. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> expand that shelf even faster. Wow. Yeah, we're we'll putting a new section actually. Okay. Great combo. <laughs> um, on behalf of the board and our um, our members and our guests today, we really want to thank all of you for being here, um, for fielding all these great questions. I think it was a really good discussion and dialogue. And uh, please let us know. Please let us board members know if you like this format. I like it. Because um, we'd like to do more of this in the future. I think it generates really good discussion um, and it, it helps all of us at the end of the day. So thank you all for coming and thank you to all of you for your time. I know you're busy Thanks. guys and we appreciate uh, the time you take to speak with us. Yeah. Yes, I'm going to Well done. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.